Good evening. Coming up tonight, winter break will be here before we know it. How the Student Senate is making sure final exams go as smoothly as possible. Plus, hear how the women's Gamecock basketball team will take on the City of Love. And later, Heidi Klum gets cocky on the red carpet. But first, Nicole Smith is in the studio here with us now. Nicole, what weather can we expect to see this weekend? Well, Aaron, we can be expecting to see some colder weather coming in because of that cold front, but that sun will be coming out, so we'll be expecting some sunny days ahead. I have the weather forecast for this week and more for you tonight on SGTV Student News at 7. Live from the Kennedy Greenhouse Studio. This is Student News at 7. Good evening, Carolina. I'm Aaron Smith. And I'm Bridget Bruchowski. Thanks for joining us tonight. Our top story today. According to the state newspaper, Alex Murdaugh's lawyers are asking for the South Carolina Supreme Court to remove Judge Newman from the case. The attorneys say Newman was involved in matters that will be discussed in an upcoming hearing involving alleged jury tampering from the original trial. It's been nearly nine months since Murdaugh was sentenced for the murders of his wife and his son. We'll keep you updated as we learn more. At the State House, presidential hopeful and former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley is now officially on the 2024 ballot. SGTV reporter Cla Clarissa Meyer has more on her plans to win the White House. I'm here at the South Carolina State House where Nikki Haley has just officially filed for the presidential primary ballot. Let's take a look. Nikki Haley has formally filed to appear on the South Carolina Republican presidential primary ballot. This is the first time anyone has signed on to be president in this Capitol building. Before the former governor's arrival, Haley was preceded by three of her strongest supporters, a South Carolina representative, Nathan Ballantyne, State Senator Tom Davis, and Congressman Ralph Norman. Haley was the first woman and person of color to become a South Carolina governor, also representing Gen X at 38, being the youngest governor at any state at the time. After being re-elected in 2015, she signed a bill to remove the Confederate battle flag from the South Carolina State House after the shooting at the Emanuel African Methodist in Charleston. Now at that same State House, supporters lined the stairs with signs awaiting her arrival. Addressing the crowd with it being a great day in South Carolina, Haley resides with South Carolina being her family. Haley reiterates how the country is suffering and needs saving and speaks on how she has what it takes. So I've always been the underdog. I enjoy that. It's what makes me scrappy. Um, but no one's going to outwork me in this race. No one's going to outsmart me in this race. It is slow and steady wins the race, but you win it based on relationships. You win it based on touching every hand, answering every question, and earning the trust of the American people. And she spoke on how the U.S. should remain quiet with Israel America and related the emotions back to not provoking another September 11th. A high school supporter from Georgia, J.T. Marshburn, tells us how he thinks a new generation of leadership is needed. She is really the right person for the job, and she really is the right person for our age, for Gen Z, for Gen X, for everybody. Afterwards, Haley stayed to meet all of her supporters. Nikki Haley is continuing to prep for future debates and working to catch up on her frontrunner, Donald Trump. For SGTV News, I'm Clarissa Meyer. Thanks, Clarissa. The South Carolina Department of Social Services is the first state social service program in the, co in the country to be sensory inclusive certified. The distinction includes accommodations for invisible disabilities which are disabilities that may not be noticeable right away, such as Alzheimer's, PTSD, and light and sound sensitivities. 4,000 DSS employees completed Culture City's sensory inclusive training over the last six months. The training focuses on accessibility and acceptance of invisible disabilities. Law enforcement and first responders across the country have completed the same program through Culture City. DSS offices across the state now have sensory inclusion bags with items such as noise-canceling headphones. All locations have signs to mark the locations as sensory inclusive. An update on a nationwide issue that's made its way to South Carolina. 
the Lexington Richland 5 School District is in the process of re reviewing a challenged book to be banned from school libraries. The book in question is A Court of Mist and Fury by Sarah J. Moss, sitting at 650 pages. It's tied as the 10th most challenged book in the nation, according to the American Library Association, due to claims that it's overly sexually explicit. But some committee members reviewing the book say they are not able to finish it in time for a vote next week. The district school board voted against extending the deadline so members could finish the book, which goes against the review policy. Already this year, Lexington School District 2 has pulled 17 books from the, its shelves, and now a court of mist and fury may be added to this in nearby Lexington Richland 5. Here on campus, new research initiatives in public health and technology are on the way. The University of South Carolina will invest $10 million towards five projects. The initiatives are based around topics like semiconductor chips, clean water, rural education, and cardiovascular and infectious disease research. The university says it hopes the new institute will address and help ease these growing issues in the state. Each institute will receive $500,000 per year over a four-year period. Unfortunately, you can't have winter break without final exams. According to the Daily Gamecock, the Student Senate is working to keep Thomas Cooper Library open 24 hours a day during the week leading up to final exams. The extended hours would give students more time to prepare for exams and end of semester projects. This can be especially beneficial for students who live on campus and rely on the library as a place to study and get work done. The Student Senate unanimously passed the recommendation but is still waiting on approval from student body president Emmy Thomas and a signature from university president Michael Amaritis. Currently, Thomas Cooper Library is open until 2 a.m. Sunday through Thursday nights and until 7 p.m. on weekends. If approved, the earliest recommendation would be implemented in the spring semester. A popular outdoor spot for USC students is back in better condition. Nearly 38,000 tons of toxic coal tar has been removed from the Congaree River. SGTV reporter Chloe Castain has more on why the Clean Un project finished earlier than expected. Construction on the Congaree has been happening for quite some time, but visitor Matthew Wingard doesn't know what for. And we had no idea about the, the tar situation or the toxic tar. That was, that, that was a new one. The construction is electrical company Dominion Energy's efforts to remove long-standing toxic tar from the bottom of the Congaree River. This project includes two temporary cofferdams used to drain water from the area and dig up the tar. The entire cleanup was supposed to take between three and five years, but it just took two. Congaree Riverkeeper Ben Stangler says the completion of the cofferdam is a step in the right direction. It really does uh, signify kind of a big milestone, not just for this particular project, but for our rivers and, and the future of our rivers here in the Midlands. Okay. Stangler says the pace of repairs are for a number of reasons. Materials used to build cofferdam 2 were recycled from cofferdam 1 leaving a bed of rock where it once was. Stangler also says that trial and error between the two cofferdams and low water levels, historically seen in the summer, helped the quickness of the cleaning. The cofferdams come after the discovery of the 100 plus year toxic tar polluting the river, but visitors like Wingard are speechless at the pace of repairs. Uh, and I'm, I'm so, I mean, look at the, the work they're doing. It's, I, just a, I mean, it's really fantastic. While we were unable to get inside of the cofferdam, you could still see it from the Gervais and Senate Street bridges. For Carolina Insider, I'm Chloe Castain. I'm so glad to see that they're taking the initiative to really help up a better part of our community. It's important to keep our environment clean and a lot of people love going to the river just to enjoy nature and be present. So I think it's great that this project is ahead of schedule. Yeah, I know that's something that I really enjoy to do on the weekends. Yeah, absolutely. Coming up after the break, SGTV weather reporter Nicole Smith will let us know if we can expect this cool weather to stick around. Stay close. Welcome back, Carolina. I'm Nicole Smith. Here's your look at tonight's temperatures. You can see we're going to be having some lower temperatures here hitting tonight, hitting 50, but 
do not worry, just grab a jacket, anything like that, because it's gonna have some colder temperatures. Now, that sunset is gonna be coming here at 5.50, so hopefully you got to catch, get out and catch that here tonight. Now, looking at what this week is gonna look like, like I said, we're gonna have some colder temperatures with that cold front coming in, so those colder temperatures you're gonna be feeling here this week, but that sun is coming out, so we're gonna have some sunny days ahead of us with a couple clouds, so nothing to worry about. We're in a high pressure system right now, so we're not gonna be seeing any storms. Now, taking a look at what these highs are looking like, as you can see, we're going to start with those colder temperatures, but we're going to warm up just a little bit here, getting all the way to those low 80s. So that's as far as high as it's going to get this week. And finishing out this week, we're going to be going right back down into those lower 80s, um, all the way down to those low 60s. Now, taking a look at what South Carolina is looking like as a whole, as you can see, we're going to have some colder temperatures. Sephora and Greenwood, they're just going to be be burning up apparently with those higher temperatures, but that is a okay because the rest of the state is going to be pretty chilly. So hopefully they can bring in some of that coldness to help cool them down. And that's all I have for tonight. Coming up after the break, SGTV sports reporter Dakota Morris and Isabella Davis will have the latest in sports. You don't want to miss it. Stay with us. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Dakota Morris and I'm Isabella Davis here to give you the latest in sports. Yesterday, the Gamecock women's basketball team jetted off to Paris to play Notre Dame for their season opener. The matchup next Monday will mark the first NCAA regular season basketball game to be played in the City of Light. This experience marks the first international trip for some of the players, like freshman guard Malaysia Fulwiley. Other players have international basketball experiences, like Chloe Kitts, Raven Johnson, Tahina Pow Pow, and Sanaya Fagan have all traveled with USA Basketball. As the team preps to face the Fighting Irish, they will also get time to explore the City of Love. Today, the Gamecocks visited the Eiffel Tower. Some other activities planned include a lunch with the mayor of Paris, a trip to the Louvre, and a dinner cruise down the Seine. Family and friends were able to give a proper send-off to the team on Halloween during the team's trick or treat. Trick or treaters got to meet the players during an open practice and take part in some Halloween festivities. Tune in to ESPN next Monday at 1.30 to watch the first college basketball game ever played on French soil. This is a really amazing opportunity for the Gamecocks and for Notre Dame, honestly. It really is. I'm so jealous they're in Paris right now. I really wish we could fly over and see them for Monday's game. Me too. I saw some Twitter pictures from Don Saley and the team, and they seem to be having a really good time. Definitely. Looking on the green, this past Sunday, the Gamecock men's golf team teed off at Daniel, the Daniel Island Intercollegiate. The Gamecocks concluded the tournament on Tuesday with an individual first place win. South Carolina finished the first day tied third thanks to senior Rafe Reynolds, sophomore Frankie Harris, junior Nathan Franks, and sophomore Zach Adams. These same four players pushed the Gamecocks into second place the second day of the tournament, shooting four under 284, one shot behind first place. Frankie Harris led the way for the Gamecocks in the second round, shooting three under 69 and recording only one bogey all day. Thus, it was no surprise when Harris took the individual first place win. Harris went into the final round on Tuesday two shots behind, but he concluded the day shooting 70 two under. Throughout the duration of the tournament, Harris recorded 11 birdies and four bo bogeys for 54 <laughs> holes. Though this is Harris's first career win, it is not the Gamecocks. Last fall, junior Gene Ziegler took home the win for the Gamecocks. As a team, the Gamecocks finished fourth at five under and shot 290 two over. This tournament concludes the fall season with the spring season beginning February 11th at the Puerto Rico Classic. Taking to the pitch, Gamecock men's soccer had their last game of the season Tuesday night on the road at Marshall University. The Gamecocks came out aggressive, tallying three shots on goal to Marshall's one in the first half. The tides turned in the second half as the thundering herd responded. Marshall scored their first goal in the 51st minute and again in the 69th minute as the ball barely made it through goalkeeper Ben Alexander's grip. The Gamecocks ultimately, ultimately fell 2-0 to number four Marshall. Men's soccer will hit the road to Orlando this weekend as they kick off the first round of the Sun Belt Conference Tournament. The men will play the number one UCF Knights this Sunday at 7 p.m. 
In Gamecock football, last Saturday, the Gamecocks played their last game on the road for the regular season with a 30-17 loss to the Texas A&M Aggies. The team started the game off strong, le leading 7-0 from a touchdown from DeCarion Joyner with only two minutes left in the first quarter. The teams were knotted at seven in the second quarter until the Aggies recorded two more touchdowns before the end of the half, making it 21-7. Both teams kicked a field goal in the third, bringing the score to 24-10. Spencer Rattler found Joshua Simon for a touchdown in the first play of the fourth quarter. However, after the Gamecocks cut the lead to 24-17, the Aggies shut them down for good. Rattler went into the game with a season average of 277 passing yards, but could only manage 176 yards against the Aggie defense. The Gamecocks as a whole only picked up 209 yards compared to the Aggies' 354. This game marks the fourth straight loss for the Gamecocks and their fifth loss in the SEC this season. South Carolina will play four games at home this November, starting with Jacksonville State this Saturday. This game will also serve as a reunion for the 2010-2013 football teams who will be honored at halftime. Former Gamecock head coach Steve Furrier will also be honored along with the team. I'm really excited to see Steve back on the field again. It's been a few years and I feel like it'll be great to see what he has to say and who knows, maybe even bring some good luck charm to the Gamecocks for this weekend's game. Yeah, I'm really hoping he can maybe put some pep in their step this weekend. Coming up after the break, SGTV entertainment reporters Emma Wyatt and Destiny Austin will lay down the talk of the town. Stay tuned. Welcome back, Carolina. I'm Destiny Austin. And I'm Emma Wyatt, here to give you the latest in this week's entertainment. Ready to get your mind blown? Carolina Productions will be hosting Cocky on My Mind with Aaron, Eric Dittleman on Tuesday, November 7th at 7 p.m. in the Russell House Ballroom. Mind reader and stand-up comedian Eric Dittleman will be there to show off his special skills. He is most well known for his appearance on season seven of America's Got Talent. Dittleman was the first ever mind reader on the show and made it all the way as a top 10 finalist and was the judge's favorite. The comedian has also made guest appearances on Ellen and Live with Kelly and Ryan. Students will get to experience a fun and interactive show and see Dittleman perform his mind reading talent in person. Whether you believe in such things or not, it will definitely be exciting to go and watch with your friends. This event is free for students, faculty, and staff with a valid Carolina card. Tuning in to local music, the return of Columbia's Jam Room Festival has many excited for the weekend. This music festival includes a full day of performances from local Columbia artists to showcase their talents for others to enjoy. The Jam Room Festival is completely free and will be held on Saturday, November 4th on Main Street from 12 p.m. to 10 p.m. A student band here at USC called the Third Floor Band competed in a battle of the bands at the Coger Center for the Arts of opening a gig at this festival. This is a very big honor and allows for artists to be able to see what it would be like to take up with bigger artists on stage and preparing them for what the music industry will be like in the real world. The Jam Room Music Festival is a great way to not only support local artists, but up and coming artists here at USC. The days are getting shorter and the nights are getting longer, which of course means this weekend we get to set our clocks back and get an extra hour of sleep. To celebrate this, the City of West Columbia is hosting the 7th Annual Fallback Fest. This event will be held this Friday at the 100 block of State Street in West Columbia from 5.30 to 9.30 p.m. It's a free event open to the public and will feature local live music and a live art performance. The live art performance is a unique experience where local artists paint a, temp a new temporary mural live in front of guests. This year, 10 artists are participating. Guests can also stroll down the street, shop around, and have a good time at the surrounding shops and restaurants, which will be staying open late for the festival. If a celebration with art, live music, and food sounds appealing, head to the Fallback Fest this Saturday. When it is time for Halloween, there's always something to look forward to when Heidi Klum's Halloween Bash comes to town. The celebrity was decked out in a peacock mask and blue velvet bodysuit while Cirque du Soleil dancers escorted her as tail feathers, her husband, Tom Kalowitz, was, known other, was none other than her precious egg. 
Heidi has been throwing elaborate Halloween parties since the turn of this century. So each year she finds a way to make extravagant ideas come to life, and 2023 is no different. The celebrity lineup this year consisted of Alex Earl, James Charles, Camila Cabello, Becky G, and many more. As each year goes by, the Halloween costumes get more and more elaborate. elaborate. You know, I always look forward to Heidi Klum's costumes. Last year, she was a worm, and I thought it was so cool. That was so funny, and she was just on the floor, and her <laughs> mouth was moving. It's yeah. been a lot of fun to see everybody go out for Halloween this year. Yeah. What I were you? Everyone, oh, I was a, a construction worker. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's all your entertainment news for tonight. After the break, we'll have tonight's edition of Carolina Canines. And finally, tonight's Carolina Canine features Walt. This happy pup was submitted by SGTV News 4 director Alex Teeter. Walt is a four-year-old King Charles Cavalier Spaniel who loves to run around in the sun and snuggle with his mom. In his free time, you can find Walt outside chasing birds in his yard. As a Disney fan, Walt is the cutest name for this little pup. And I just love when we get puppy pictures because they look so adorable and I love seeing them when they're all grown up too. I look forward to it every single week. <laughs> That's our wrap of tonight's edition of Student News at 7. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, X, and Facebook at SGTV at USA. To keep up with all of our content, be sure to also visit us online at SGTV at USC.com. For SGTV News 4, I'm Erin Smith. And I'm Bridget Burchowski. From all of us here at SGTV, have a great night, Carolina, and forever to thee.